Hello, so today I'm picking up in Psalm chapter 109, and it says, Hold not thy peace, O God of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compassed me about also with words of hatred, and fought against me without a cause. For my love, they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. And they have rewarded me evil for good, and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become a sin, become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife with a, and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vag vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath, and let the strangers spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him. Neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord, and let not the sin of his, mo his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth, because that he remembered not to show mercy but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing like as with his garment, so let it come into his bowels like water, and like oil into his bones. Let it be unto him as the garment which covereth and for a girdle wherewith he is girded continually. Let this be the reward of mine adversaries from the Lord, and of them that speak evil against my soul. But do thou for me, O God, the Lord, for thy name's sake, because thy mercy is good, deliver thou me. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. I am gone like the shadow when it declineth, I am tossed up and down as the locust. My knees are weak through fasting, and my flesh faileth of fatness. I, am, I became also a reproach unto them. When they looked upon me, they shaked their heads. Help me, O Lord my God, O save me according to thy mercy, that they may know that this is thy hand, that thou, Lord, hast done it. Let them curse, but bless thou. When they arise, let them be ashamed, but let thy servant rejoice. Let mine adversaries be clothed with shame, and let them cover themselves with their own confusion as with a mantle. I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth, yea, I will praise him among the multitude. For he shall stand at the right hand of the poor, to save him from those that condemn his soul. So, it's... Again, we're kind of, you know, moving through and seeing this transition that um, David's gone through from his suffering and then his thanksgiving and his um, psalms and kind of back into his condemnation of the wicked. Um, but here, there are a couple of important things about this chapter that are interesting to notice. First of all, this... Uh, let his days, in verse 8, let his days be few, and let another take his office. This is um, referenced in Acts chapter 1. Um, in Acts chapter 1, verse 20, it says, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Bishopric is like an office, like a bishop. Um, when he says... Let his habitation be desolate. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's referencing this specific psalm, 
there's probably another that it's more uh, related to. But this reminds me of that one. A lot of the things that David writes are very similar. Sometimes he writes things, um, similar praises or psalms or just little sayings um, that are similar but just a little bit different because there's something to teach us. So, you know, it this prophetically can obviously be referring to uh, Judas because Judas persecuted Christ. But if we keep reading and we go down when he says that um, they shake their heads, I became also a reproach unto them. When they looked upon me, they shaked their heads. And that's interesting because if we go to the end of Luke 23, um, it says in Luke 23, um, 39, well, we can start <clears throat> in 35. It says, And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be king of the Jews, save thyself. And the superscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Um, let's see if I can find a different one. It doesn't say specifically that the wagging of the heads, but it gives a little bit of context that these people are passing by and cursing him as he's in his affliction. Um, let's see. They that passed by, in Mark 15, 29, and they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. And so we can see some of this is prophetically referring to Christ. Also, the suffering that Christ goes through is very similar to the suffering that the children of Israel will go through um, during their tribulation, uh, just because he calls them to you know, the same type of condemnation that uh, he suffered was the same thing that they're uh, called to sort of be part of this. Um, anyway, I'm not going to go too much into that as a different uh, study. But basically, when he talks about um, up here that they curse and love cursing, and so we know this is, you know, prophetically referring to Christ and all the people that reproached him. This phrase up here, he says, without a cause, is a very important phrase because whenever we see that phrase, we know that it's referring specifically to Christ because um, without a cause... Right here in John 15, 25, it says, But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And so Christ is saying here that this phrase, without a cause, is the fulfillment of what's written in the Old Testament that is written of him. That whenever we see this phrase, it's an indicator that the passage is referring to him, and specifically how they hated him without a cause. Um, so that's sort of an indicator of the doctrinal and slash prophetical reference of this entire chapter. Now, historically, David was writing this. Um, I, I couldn't know this for a fact, but I'm willing to bet that he's writing this about Shimei um, because he's writing about someone in this specific as he loved cursing, so let it come unto him, as he delighted not in blessings, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing, like as with a garment, so let it come into his bowels like water, and like oil into his bones. And um, this part where he says, um, 
where is it? Where he shook his head, and that he be, that David became approach unto them. Um, and so this man Shimei. Okay, so here in Second Samuel chapter sixteen, um, David has been cast out of Jerusalem, and this is because of a conspiracy by his son Absalom. And back when Dave, a long time ago, um, at the beginning of 2 Samuel, or in the middle of 2 Samuel, I guess you could say, uh, David, um, he lusted after, he coveted after Uriah's wife Bathsheba, and he slept with her, and uh, she got pregnant. And in order to cover up uh, his sin, because she was pregnant, and everyone would know that because her husband was at war, somebody must have slept with her. So in order to cover up what he had done, he ordered Uriah back from the front lines, and was hoping that Uriah would go home and sleep with his wife, so that he could pretend like the son was actually Uriah's. Well, Uriah came back, but he didn't go home. He slept outside in the streets because he said, how can I go home and, you know, find, be sleeping with my wife when all of my fellow soldiers are still fighting the battle? And he kind of makes it, it's kind of an, it's not geared, it's not intended as an insult to David. But I have, I'm confident that David felt offended by that statement, like Uriah was judging him for not being in the war himself. And rightly so, because David should have been in the war. He was the warring king. That's where his place was. He was the general king. Um, and he was, you know, God gave him victory over his enemies. That's where he belonged, was in the battle. Um, but for some reason, he didn't go to battle that time. He remained idle at home, and uh, he made occasion for the flesh. So Uriah doesn't do what David's hoping. And he goes away. And so David's like, well, this sucks. Um, how about this? How about I send to Joab, my captain of the host, my chief military officer, and I have Uriah go to the you know, most uh, dangerous part of the front line where the most valiant enemy soldiers are, and I send them in to charge, uh, and they die. And that's what he did. And Joab is not known for being a very righteous man. Um, Joab was very manipulative the entire time. And because the battle was going against Joab, um, when Joab sent to tell David uh, how the battle was going, and which was poorly, obviously, because David wasn't there, he wasn't doing his job, um, Joab's like, oh, well, how about when you tell him that we lost the front lines and that the battle's going poorly. Make sure that you also tell him that I did as he asked and I sent Uriah into the hottest part of the battle and Uriah is dead. And maybe that will appease his wrath because Joab was a utilitarian. He didn't fear God. He did exactly what he wanted to do to save his own neck. And David heard this and he's like, no, everything's good. You did the right thing. Uh, the battle goes one way and another. Who can tell? You know, it's not your fault. It And he didn't even, you know, he's basically like, oh, Uriah's dead. Great. Don't have to worry about that. Well, Nathan, uh, the prophet, comes to David and rebukes him. And he says, you know, he gives a story of the sheep, that there's a man who had a bunch of sheep, all of the finest sheep in the world, a huge flock. And he was a very rich, wealthy man. And there's another man who had one sheep. And some dude came along to stay at the rich guy's house, and instead of taking the sheep from his own flock to satisfy his the hunger of the wanderer who came into the rich guy's house, he took the poor guy's sheep, his one and only sheep, to satisfy his own. And he killed the poor guy, because the poor guy obviously wouldn't have given up the sheep. And David is like, well, tell me who's done this, and I'll have him executed. And um, Nathan says to King David, it's you. You did this. You stole Bathsheba from Uriah. 
and you killed Uriah for it, to cover it up. And because of this, God is going to not only kill the son that you've had with Bathsheba, but he's going to take the kingdom away from you, um, from someone arising out of your own house. So there's a little bit of context for this. Absalom is David's son by one of his seven wives. Um, Absalom's sister was uh, raped by one of David's other sons, um, and then the son that raped uh, Absalom's sister, Tamar, uh, didn't marry her and hated her, and Absalom, uh, a couple chapters prior to this, had uh, uh, the, the guy who had raped his sister assassinated. He killed him. Um, and it caused a lot of problems, and, you know, there was a time when they, David had heard rumors that Absalom had killed all of his sons, but then it was found out that he only killed the, uh, the rapist, and Absalom was afraid for his life, so he ran away into another kingdom uh, to stay there for a while, um, and David, you know, longed to send after Absalom. And eventually Joab, you know, the guy that we just talked about, the manipulative utilitarian general, the captain of the host, he sends to bring Absalom back. Um, and David is still, you know, conflicted. He doesn't want to talk to Absalom even after they bring him back. And Absalom just continues to, you know, he's got this angst inside of him um, that builds up against his father because his father doesn't want to see him. He burns down Joab's field in order to, you know, make a point. And eventually after all that happens and David sees Absalom and he kisses him um, and sends him off, Absalom apparently still is bitter. And so what he does is he sits in the gate of Israel and judges the people without letting them come to see David the king. He usurps the power basically. And he wins the favor of the people. Um, and so they reject King David. And Absalom, through conspiracy, takes over the kingdom. And David leaves. And this is when he's leaving, um, fleeing with all his mighty men and all his generals and everything. Um, and so as he's fleeing... Um, in humility, because obviously David repented of this sin, but he knew that his sin still had consequences. Um, he's coming out and leaving. They're all in sorrow and everything. Um, here it is. It says in 2 Samuel 16, 7. Uh, actually, I'm going to start in 16, 5. It says, when kingdom... King David came to Bahurim. Behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee, all that blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Then said Abishai, this is Joab's brother, the son of Zer Zeruiah, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And isn't that our response to any anybody that, you know, throws stones and curses us, we just want to take off their head. But look at what King David's response is. And the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done, done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now this may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone, and let him curse. For the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look up, look on my uh, mine affliction, and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. And so they go on, and Shimei keeps throwing stuff at them and cursing them. And they were all weary, and they refreshed themselves. 
And it's just interesting because David is very humble um, in accepting this. Not only is he humble in how he handles this man cursing him, but he's humble enough to understand that this is this is an affliction and that um, he deserves it. And the things that the guy's saying may not be entirely accurate um, because the blood of Saul's house is not on David's head. Um, you know, that was something that David specifically tried to avoid. Um, David wept and gave a great lamentation when King Saul died. Um, and David gave a similar um, lamentation for uh, Jonathan, that Jonathan died. Um, and Abner, the captain of the host of Saul's army, who was Saul's uncle, uh, David specifically extended a uh, hand of peace to and you know, was working with. And Joab, you know, lo and behold, the utilitarian general who served only his flesh, assassinated Abner. The blood, and David said specifically, the blood is on you, Joab, and on the sons of Zeruiah. Again, he says here, you bloody men, um, what have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah? It's funny because it's the sons of of Zeruiah that actually do have blood on their um, blood on their head, and he's actually kind of covering for them. He's protecting um, this man Shimei who has wrongfully cursed David for something that David didn't do, and David also showed mercy to um, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, because of the covenant that David had. With Jonathan, Saul's son. So actually, David showed great kindness to the house of Saul. Um, and this is not a curse that he deserves. The man is cursing him without cause. However, even though it's without cause, he knows that this cursing is something that, you know, is just a consequence of his actions. That because of the sin that he made with um Bathsheba to bring out about reproach for Israel and for God because of what he did, that Abishai has conspired against him, and that uh, if Abishai could create legitimate reproach for something that he did, then why should he, you know, be upset about something as small as an unfounded reproach from this person who's just cursing? Um, Anyway, long story short, you know, this man curses him. David comes back into power and, um, you know, Absalom unfortunately dies at the hand of, yet again, Joab. You know, we see this man Joab more than once, and he's definitely not a good person. Um, he kills many people in his life, um, and it, he kills Absalom at the express you know, against the express command of David, who said, do not kill Absalom, bring him alive. And Joab lies about it. He says, oh, I didn't hear you when you gave that order. And he kills him anyway. And not just in, you know, you know, in the heat of battle, he kills him in cold blood. Um, just like all of the other assassinations he does, he kills at least four people in cold blood in his time. And when King Solomon comes into office after David dies, David you know, tells Solomon, he says, let not Joab's head go down to the grave uh, clean. Bring it down to the grave with blood. And um, King Solomon has Joab assassinated, or not assassinated, executed, really, because, you know, there was no cold blood. It, he was atoning, he was paying for all of the murders and wickedness he had done. At the same time, this man Shimei, um, David tells to his son, uh, and remember the cursing that this man Shimei did to me. And Solomon doesn't expressly execute Shimei, but he tells him, you better not go out of your house, because if you do, on that day you'll die. And it was a test. Are you going to be rebellious? Are you going to be, you know, continuing to stir, stir up dissent? 
or are you going to be submissive? And he disobeyed that command, and he was executed. Um, so ultimately, the man who cursed got what he deserved. But here, we see the righteousness and forbearance of David to say, you know, let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. And his cry was to God. He wasn't trying to justify himself or defend himself from reproach. And so when we go back to the original passage um, in Psalm 109, this verse down here in 28, he says, Let them curse, but bless thou. When they arise, let them be ashamed, but let thy servant rejoice. I don't know for a fact that this is the context for uh, when David wrote this psalm. There are a lot of times that David was cursed, but this is the most um, explicit time where there was a specific person, specific group of people doing evil unto David. And, um, you know, he's, his response is, Lord, you take care of it. You look upon my affliction and you give them the end of their works. Let, their pos let his posterity be cut off. All of these things, the curses against, uh, that God brings against them. But instead of him um, avenging himself, he says, Help me, O Lord my God, but save me according to thy mercy. So what is it that we can learn from this? Well, there are a couple things. First of all, he points out that the reason they are persecuting him is because of his love. For my love, they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer, and they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. And what does this remind us of? Well, if we know that it's prophetically referring to Christ, it says in John 3.16, the famous verse, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Again, in Ephesians 2, 5, 2, it says, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. This is the love of Christ. He did this, and in response, what he received was cursing. They mocked him. They took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. They mocked him. And they put on that thing over the superscription, they're making fun of him, and then, you know, they pretended that he was king, and they beat him, and they wagged their heads, and the other, you know, uh, chief priests mocked him, he saved others himself, he cannot save. They created this reproach, this false report. Why? Because what he was doing here was love. Everything that he did here was because... He was acting out of love, and that's why he endured it. And so for his love, they rendered unto him evil. There's another verse uh, that we can kind of apply for ourselves, that, like it said in Ephesians 5.2, we're supposed to walk in that same love. But it's important for us to remember that love is... Um, Not always reciprocated by the people that we're showing it to. It says, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. And so, see, that's the thing about love. It's a sacrifice. It's, um, you know, if we're doing it as Christ, he gave himself for people who killed him in return. And it was ultimately part of the, the work of God that God would raise him up from the dead and save us all. But it still resulted in them hating him in return for the love. And Paul's saying the same thing here. You know, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. So the more I give myself for you, the more I love you, the less you love me in return. But that shouldn't cause us to, you know, stop loving each other. It says in 1 Corinthians 3, or 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, Charity suffereth long and is kind. 
So there we see just the very first two things, suffereth long and is kind. It's not true love if, you know, the moment people persecute us for our love, you know, we give it up and start trying to avenge ourselves. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not, itself is not puffed up. If somebody is reproaching us and we're puffed up, we're going to feel like we have to lash back out. We have to lash out at them in return and get our vengeance. Doth, but the charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. Just like King David, he was saying, you know, let him curse. And his prayer was to God, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. In Romans uh, 12, uh, 14, it says, Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. And again down in 17, It says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. And again, as much, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire in his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And so, again, we see it's not our place to avenge ourselves. When people curse us, we bless and curse not. I'm pretty sure there's a place in Luke 6 that says something similar to this. It says in Luke 6, 28, um, starting in 27, it says, actually, I'm going to go up to... I'm going to start in 27. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And as interesting, it's very similar to what uh, King David is saying here. Hold on, let's... Um, anyway, for my love, they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. Pray for them which despitefully use you. That's what he says here in Luke uh, 6, 28. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And that's a hard thing to do, um, to not curse in return. I mean, any time we allow ourselves to become puffed up and somebody curses us, whether it's legitimate for something that's true, like Absalom uh, was um, sort of rendering unto David something that David deserved because he sinned with Bathsheba, but Shimei, the reproach he gave to King David was not deserved. It doesn't matter though, it's all reproach, it's all cursing, and we're not supposed to avenge ourselves. You know, God sees it, just like King David is talking about here. He says, you know, let their habitation be desolate. Um, all these rewards that he talks about, let the extortioner catch all that he hath, and let the strangers spoil his labor. These ends of the people who are given to cursing. So, if it's not practical enough, I'm going to make it a little bit more practical. What we're seeing here is a step-by-step -step guide on how to deal with um, all of the uh, hate, uh, and you might call it trolling, but I think that the last week has shown that there are a lot of hateful people out there willing to sling cursings at anybody and anything um, whenever they feel like it. And it's not our place to avenge ourselves. It's not our place to sling back more cursing and more uh, hate hateful and uh, proud uh, remarks. 
um, what our job is to do is just to continue in love. And it doesn't matter if people aren't loving us in return. In fact, the fact that we are hoping to continue in love may in fact cause them to hate us more in return. But that in itself is part of ha walking in love as Christ because he suffered for his love. He died for his love. And if we truly want to walk in love as Christ, then we will also be called to suffer. And ultimately, we are dead with uh, him unto sin. But it may be that uh, there are many people who have been called to actually physically die um, uh, for the love of Christ. It says in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. We are, as Paul, supposed to know him, but not just him, but the power of his resurrection and also the fellowship of his sufferings. You know, we are called as heirs of God, but we're also joint heirs with Christ and we're supposed to suffer with Christ. It says in um, 2 Timothy 1 7 through 9 7 through 8 for god hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our lord nor of me his prisoner but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of god instead of having a spirit of fear we have a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind and see that key word love that we've been talking about if we have if we remember that we have this spirit, the spirit of power of love and of a sound mind, then we shouldn't be afraid or ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of the sufferings that come with that. But we are called to be partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. And so again, we see how love often is connected with suffering. Sometimes we think that if we love everybody, that everything will be right and the world will just be a better place. But sometimes truly walking in love toward other people will cause them to hate us even more. But it's no reason to stop walking in love because the example of Christ gave for us is that he gave everything. Um, he gave himself an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet selling savor. So when we encounter stuff like, you know, this past week with the presidential election and all these people singing hateful curses at each other no matter you know what opinion political stance they take it's all the same people hating each other and cursing each other for no reason um, we know what our responsibility is to bless and curse not and to not be caught up into um, the same mistake that they make because God looks on people who curse and people who create false reports and reproach and pers uh, they can pass me about also with words of hatred and fight against me without a cause. If we are the ones who do that, then unfortunately what comes upon us is, you know, our just reward. It says in Galatians 6, 7 through 9, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And so here we remember, if we sow to the flesh, if we curse, if we avenge ourselves upon those who we think of as our enemies or those who are maybe trying to hurt us, we fight back with angry and hateful and cursing words then we are sowing to the flesh and we will reap corruption. We will reap all of those condemnations that are against people who do that. We don't want to be part of that. We just, we, it's kind of like we have to not play that game because the end of that game, whether you win or lose, is you lose. No matter what happens, when you play that game, when you play the trolling game or the cursing game, or the vengeance game where you try to justify yourself before the people who are attacking you. Whether it's valid or not, like Absalom made a valid reproach for David, but Shimei did not. It was the same. Um, we're not 
called to justify ourselves. Our prayer is to God. Um, and what's the point? Well, charity suffereth long. It's easy to be weary in well-doing, to be weary when we're walking in love. But charity suffereth long. And we must, we have to remember, number one, that when we sow to the Spirit, we reap life everlasting. We reap eternal things. We're not just talking about things that are only manifest at the judgment seat of Christ. We're talking about eternal things, things that can't be seen but are actively bear, working in this life. The fruit of the Spirit are things that we bear in this life, things that we can't see, but they're not only manifest then, they're manifest now. And God sees them and it pleases Him. In due season we shall reap if we faint not. The fruit of the Spirit, the things that we bear, they are connected with eternal rewards, but they're also connected with things that we can be having now. Um, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. These things are things that we can bring forth in our life today, even though these are not things that you can see. They're things that nobody can ever keep us from having. And they make uh, it easier to uh, be continuing to do well-doing, not being weary in well-doing. because. Like it says in Romans 5, 1 through 5. Um, I'm going to start in 3 through 5. It says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. When the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, it gives us the ability to do good, to have these eternal, to sow to the Spirit, to have this eternal aspect to the things that we suffer, the things that we do. And so when we go through tribulations, it doesn't have to be something that's grievous or saddening. Although it can often feel that way, we need to remember that tribulation itself teaches us patience. And the patience makes going through the tribulation a lot easier because there's no other way to get through it unless you have patience. And the patience works experience, which makes it easier to have patience, which makes the tribulation e even easier. And the experience makes it hope. And in the end, we wind up being able to go through tribulations that we never would have been able to go through before without it just completely destroying us because we have built up patience and on patience experience and on to experience hope and the hope ultimately is what makes us not ashamed because we're not supposed to be moved away from the hope of the gospel so when i talk about things that are manifest in this life we're not just talking about you know ultimately we are searching for eternal rewards rewards that will be manifest only when we appear before god at the judgment seat of christ but we're also talking about things that are built up in us today and inside of our hearts and as we walk in the spirit that we start to bear this fruit um, and that we gain experience and that our love grows even more when paul says in second corinthians 12 though the more abundantly i love you the less i be loved so right here it says in 12 15 though the more abundantly i love you the less i be loved he was growing in that love. His love toward them was getting even bigger. Um, he was loving them even more. And they, in turn, were unfortunately loving him even less. But it's showing how, you know, he was growing. And that as he loved them, he was being stronger in that. Um, anyway, so it's not, ultimately, it's not just the dead, you know, boring, oh, I've got to suffer today, great. It's something that we should rejoice in and have uh that we should glory in the sufferings and realize that when we suffer when we uh, walk in love as christ that there is you know great joy there um that we are having fellowship with christ himself and that ultimately we're having fellowship also 
as we have fellowship with Christ, we're having fellowship with his body. And that all the other people who have suffered in the body of Christ before us or are suffering now, that we have fellowship with them as well. And he talks about being partaker in the afflictions of the gospel. You know, this is what we're called to. It's like we have to partake in the afflictions of the gospel. But it's not just this dead thing. It's according to the power of God. That the power of God, when I'm weak, then am I strong. That the power of God works in us and does things that we could have never possibly imagined um, when we go through those sufferings. So, anyway, you know, that's what King David did uh, in Psalms. In the end, he humbled himself, he suffered, and his prayer was to God. Um, go all the way back. Um, in Psalm 109, 26, help me, O Lord, my God, O save me according to thy mercy. His prayer was to God, and he says that they may know that this is thy hand, that thou, Lord, hast done it. Let them curse, but bless thou. When they arise, let them be ashamed, but let thy servant rejoice. Let mine adversaries be clothed with shame, and let them cover themselves with their own confusion as with a mantle. I will greatly pr praise the Lord with my mouth, yea, I will praise him among the multitude. So as they curse, it's our responsibility to, instead of cursing in return, to praise, praise God and bless with our mouth. For he shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those that condemn his soul. Ultimately, when God looks on us, he says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. It's the place of God to judge between the persecutor and the persecuted, and to render each person according to their works. Um, and when we suffer, he renders vengeance, not just unto the people who, do, who dish out all the suffering, but to the ones who endure it. He says in Romans 8, 18, or 17 and 18, and if children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So when we suffer, he doesn't just provide vengeance, but he renders glory, because as Christ suffered and died, that's what we're called to partake in. And not just a temporal glory that lasts for a time, you know, it's so much glory, it's Christ's glory that we are called to partake in, that it can't even be compared with the sufferings themselves that we had to endure in the first place in order to be counted worthy of that glory. So that's a very hopeful thought. Um, and we shouldn't, even when we feel weird, we should never feel hopelessness. Um, and ultimately, God let God saw David's humbleness, and he brought King David back into the kingdom. And not only did he establish King David's kingdom, but he gave unto King David an heir, King Solomon, who was the wisest and most wealthy person uh, to ever have lived. And Solomon built up a kingdom that I don't think many of us can quite wrap our minds around today. And if we were to see it, I think it would probably surpass uh, even what our imagination can conjure up when we read through the Old Testament, just because our minds are so limited by our perspective of what things were like back then. I don't think we truly grasp um, the glory of King Solomon's kingdom. Uh, so he, he did. He brought King David back. King David was humbled. And in the end, he was blessed. But when he was suffered the cursing, his primary response was, I will cry to God, and I will bless God with my soul and with my mouth, instead of turning and railing on these people who are casting stones and reproaching me and mocking me. Because God looks on those people and deals with them. But my hope 
is in God. And so hopefully we can deal this uh, approach other people the same way because there are a lot of people dishing out um, their own fair sh cursing and bitterness and hate right now as we speak. Um, but we're all called to endure that uh, and not just endure it, but to continue growing in our love toward them, to bless and curse not, um, and be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Anyway, that's what I get out of uh, Psalms chapter 109.